Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. I'm Nate Silver. And, and this, this is, is Model Talk. Talk. We are recording this on Thursday, but if you're hearing this, it means that it's at least Friday and that we have officially launched our Senate forecast model. So I encourage everyone to go check it out on 538.com, but we're going to discuss it here. And the top line numbers are Republicans have a 42% chance of maintaining control of the Senate and Democrats have a 58% chance of winning control of the chamber. That's according to our deluxe model, which we'll get into. To. The single likeliest outcome, according to the forecast, is a 50-50 split in the chamber. And of course, the vice president breaks a tie in the Senate. Nathaniel Silver, the first question I have for you is, have you pressed record on your microphone? On my microphone or on my computer? On your you computer. Know, I'm having... Connected to your microphone. Uh, it, it, it's been recording for upwards of two minutes now. All right. All without, right. Keep an eye on that. Without incident. Yeah, you can't you can't fail me twice like that. That's got to be the only time this uh, election so what, season. What what happens when I don't record it? So Tony records a backup Skype audio file, which is pretty poor quality, and then also requires us to go through and cut out everyone else's voice from your audio in that oh file. My God. So okay. it's more yeah. work, wow. and the audio quality sucks, but. We didn't have to retape the entire podcast in case anyone was wondering from what happened on Monday. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, okay. Now that we have cleared that up, Nate, how would you describe the state of the race for the Senate since we have, you've completed the forecast, you can see the output. What's the state of the race? Um, the state of the race is that Democrats are in a better position than um than they probably thought they would have been in a year from now, or a year ago, I should say. Um, there are an awful lot of competitive seats, um, but by no means is it a done deal. Um, there are basically no seats where you would guarantee a Democratic pickup. There is one seat in particular in Alabama where they're likely to, to lose ground or lose Doug Jones, probably will not be reelected, running against a non-Roy Moore candidate. So that means Democrats might need to pick up four or five seats, depending on if they win the presidency, which is kind of a, a pretty tall order. Um, there's also a kind of contrast between um, the polls and other indicators of the race. Um, so if you look at our forecast, there are actually, this is a return from 26, 2018, there are actually three different versions that are called light, classic, and deluxe. Um, mm. And they layer, mm, makes me hungry. We're taping this just before lunchtime. Indeed. Could use a burger. Uh, and they layer different versions on top of one another, different information, right? Whereas light, as much as possible, is based on polls, classic ads and fundamentals factors like um, like uh, fundraising, for example. Um, and then deluxe also adds in expert projections. So based on the polls alone, Democrats have a 69% chance, so pretty nice chance of winning um, the Senate in the light version. In classic, that goes down to 64, and then deluxe, it goes down to 58. So part of what's happening here is that, I mean, Democrats' polls in a lot of these Senate races look pretty good, right? There was a poll earlier this week that had um, Lindsey Graham tied in South Carolina with Jamie Harrison. Um, and that's an interesting poll for Democrats, right? Um, but is the model essentially of- saying that, yeah, that's a great poll for Democrats, but based on other things like the partisanship right. of the state, or fundraising, right. or whatever yeah. else, that we don't really trust that Lindsey Graham's actually going to lose that race. There's a chance, right? But like, but yeah, I mean, um, I think the deluxe forecast has him with like a 15% chance of losing, which is not trivial. It's higher than a lot of people thought. Um, but, you know, Democrats are competing against a lot of incumbents in a lot of red states, um, in states that Trump will probably win. Um you know, and so it's not an easy lift necessarily, even though incumbents aren't nearly as advantaged as they once were. Um, I mean, look, you have some pretty easy pickups for Democrats, right? Um, like Colorado, for, Arizona. Colorado, Arizona, probably the two easiest. You know, Mark Kelly's been ahead in almost every poll, although 
McSally has tightened the margins a little bit in some polls. Um, Colorado is a very purple state now. Um, Maine is a not relatively easy pickup. I mean, Susan Collins is kind of a tradition there. <laughs> um, she has been popular for a long time. Her popularity has gone way down, but um, an incumbent who won by whatever it was, 25 or 30 points like she won last time, I think should not be written off, right? But it's a still, it's a state where... Um, you know, Gideon, her polling has been strong. Biden's strolling has been strong in Maine as well. Um, so, Nate, one question North I have to Carolina, ask, though, yeah. is that in 2018, we saw that the partisanship of the state, whether or not the state voted for Trump in the 2016 election, essentially overrode any thoughts of an incumbent advantage. We saw that in a lot of states, right? Ultimately, even if there was a Democratic incumbent, like in North Dakota or Indiana, the Republican challenger ultimately prevailed. When we look at states like North Carolina, maybe a bit more purple, but Iowa or Montana, some of the states that Democrats could be relying on in order to win the Senate, those are fundamentally red states. Is there a reason that we should think things will go differently in 2020 from the way that they did in 2018 in terms of state partisanship really overriding everything? No, I mean, it probably will, right? I mean, there is some degree of ticket splitting. But if we look at the Senate map, right, then, okay, Democrats are favored um, to win the contests in Colorado, um, Maine, win the presidential race in Colorado, Maine, and Arizona. That's places where they're um, at least, Biden's at least 60% to win, right? Biden has almost no chance of winning Alabama. So, um Take uh, take those three, right? Democrats are at net two. Now, North Carolina, Biden is favored, but that's much closer, for example. But he is favored there, so that would make it net three, which would just be barely enough, right? But then there's two races in Georgia, which is we have Trump a little bit ahead, but very close. There's a race in Iowa. We have Trump a little bit ahead, but very close. Texas, Trump a little bit ahead, but very close, right? So, you know, I mean, this is kind of the situation here where a really narrow Biden win, let's say that Biden um, wins Pennsylvania. By the way, there aren't a lot of Senate races in the Midwest this year. Democrats are playing defense in them anyway, right? Let's say Biden has a good but not great night, and that consists of winning Pennsylvania, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona, all states that uh, that Clinton did not win in 2016. That's a comfortable-ish Biden margin. It might translate to like a four or five point win in the popular vote for Biden, right? Um, but let's say he loses Florida, North Carolina, um, and Iowa, and Texas, and, and Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Um, and every Senate race follows a presidency there. And Democrats actually don't win the Senate there. They're 51 to 49. They're one seat short. Um, and so, you know, um, the Senate is a heavier lift for Democrats than the presidency. Um, it's not crazy to think that the races behave in a quirky way and somehow Trump wins and Democrats take the Senate. It's not crazy, crazy, but it's it's that's less likely than the other way around. Where does it look like the races are most likely to diverge in terms of the presidency and the Senate. I think, for example, looking at Texas, right, Biden has a much better chance than the Democratic challenger MJ Hager there. Again, in Maine, we already discussed, but Susan Collins has a better chance of winning Maine than Trump does. Um, yeah. Are those the two main ticket splitting contests we see? Maybe Montana as well. Are there other ones? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Democrats would say, hey, look, Montana, we have the current governor there. He's very popular. He's a moderate. Um, we Our other senator is a Democrat and John Tester, and he won re-election last time. So, you know, it might not be crazy. Um, in North Carolina, the Democrat Cal Cunningham has generally pulled a bit more strongly than Biden and had clearer leads. The Republican incumbent there, Tom Tillis, is, has a fairly low approval rating. He has not raised a lot of money. He barely won last time. He might just kind of be like a classic kind of weak incumbent. We get to more exotic things. I think that Lindsey Graham, I actually would probably be a buyer of our 15% for Jamie Harrison there. Um, Interesting. Because I think Lindsey Graham, like, our kind of model says, oh, it seems like a fairly strong incumbent. I think like the kind of being seen as kind of a moderate squish and then being really MAGA. Is that how you say that? 
We cover politics for like, I'm never sure if it's MAGA or MAGA or hashtag MG. I think it depends on your regional accent. As a Midwesterner, I think you'd say MAGA. MAGA. Um, I'm not sure that Lindsey Graham kind of has made anybody in that state happy, right? But there are, yeah, I mean, look, there are, there are all these races that are quirky. Um, and sometimes quirks do happen, right? Democrats had a very good midterm in 2018. However, Bill Nelson lost in Florida. Um, still a very consequential loss. He's an incumbent in an environment that was Democrat plus eight or plus nine nationally. And yes, Florida is um, been frustrating for Democrats, but still that was kind of a, a surprise. Um, yeah. Tester and Joe Manchin held on when Claire McCaskill and, and all the other people did not, right? And so it's, it's you know, it's um, Senate races can march to their own drummer a little bit. There's also in Georgia, there's two elections there, including um, a special election um, with Kelly Loeffler, among other Republicans running and several Democrats running. Um, so there could be quirks on the map. And there are places where, you know, in Michigan, Republicans have a candidate, John James, who um, was pretty vigorous in 2018. He's running again against Gary Peters, who is not um, the most spectacular incumbent. So there, there are quirks on either side here. You mentioned that the national environment in 2018 was Democrat plus eight or nine. How do we expect the national environment to compare with that this fall? And of course, it's worth pointing out to listeners who maybe haven't paid copious amounts of attention to the Senate map that the map just looks better for Democrats this year. They're more on the attack than on the defense as they were in 2018. So it's not just a case of the environment mattering. It's also which seats are up. But but in general, in terms of the environment, what do we expect this year? Um, so Democrats are ahead by about six points on the generic congressional ballot. So just kind of ask which party you'd prefer to have control of Congress or who would vote for in your district. That six point lead compares to an eight or nine point lead that Democrats finished with in 2018. So the environment is not quite as good for them as it was. Um, look, so part of it, it, it's the echo year of 2014 when Republicans won everything that, you know, had a move that moved basically um, in the Senate. Um, but still remember the Senate has a pretty strong built in, Republican, it's not a built-in Republican bias, right? But when you have like a built-in design where Wyoming has as many senators as California, that tends to overweight um, rural states relative to their share of the population, and rural states tend to be more Republican, right? Um, so there are all these targets that Democrats have in Georgia and Texas and Arizona, um, you know, South Carolina, right? With the exception maybe of Arizona, which is truly becoming more of a purple state, um, these are all red-leaning states. Um, they are red-leaning states in an environment where you're ahead six on the generic ballot and Biden's ahead seven, right, um, where you can make them very competitive. Um, but they're not easy places to win for Democrats. When it comes to liberal or progressive Democrats who think about this fall as their opportunity to pass a bunch of more progressive or liberal legislation— should they be looking more at the Democrats' odds in the Senate almost as an indicator of whether or not they can pass that agenda than necessarily Joe Biden's odds? So Joe Biden's odds of winning right now are 75%. But our deluxe version shows that Democrats have about a 57 58% chance of winning the Senate. Is that the actual chance or those are the actual odds that, that the progressive Democrats will be able to implement their agenda? No, look, uh, if you're a progressive Democrat, then you have two or three problems, right? One of which is Joe Manchin. Um, maybe Kirsten Cinema in Arizona is often pretty mavericky in the Arizonan tradition. Um, you know, if Doug Jones somehow wins re-election, I think he'll have to decide whether um, whether he's hoping to win re-election again in six years or he's like, screw it, I'm just going to vote for the progressive agenda. But like, no, I think... Um, you know, so it's less than 50, 57% is what you're saying. Like, they'd actually have to win big, uh, a, a sizable majority. I mean, every number of margins at the margin. You know, I think, you know, with 52, you can do more than with 50. With 54, you can do a lot more than with 52, right? Once you get to 54 or so, then you have a comfortable margin where um, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema can do their thing, right? Um, and you could have one person object for weird reasons and... 
someone else gets COVID and can't vote, right? And you still have 50 and Vice President Harris breaks the tie, right? And this is um, also assuming that they blow up the filibuster. But just to give listeners a sense, what are the chances that Democrats get 54 seats or more in the Senate? So in deluxe, a 15% chance of having 54 or more. 52 or more gets up to like a, you know, 33% chance or something, right? So if you, if you can somehow get to 52 and keep everyone except for Manchin and Cinema in line, then you can do some things. So again, the odds of that happening are more or less similar to the odds of Trump winning in 2016. So if you believe that things that have a 30% chance of happening can happen, um, then there you have it. But I want to dig into a little more of the nerdy aspect of this for a second. How much did the Senate forecast model change since 2018? So not really very much. Um, we uh, did a couple of things, though, um, and these are going to be fairly technical. Um, one is that the kind of fundamentals that we talked about before, um, we reestimated those equations to account for changes as a result of partisanship. Um, you know, basically now a state's partisan lean or a district's partisan lean when we release the House model matters even more. Um, factors that we call candidate quality, like, you know, experience and whether you had a scandal or not in fundraising, those matter less than they once did as a result of higher polarization and partisanship. So that's one change doesn't have huge effects, but some effects. Um, another change is we um, we are estimating house effects a bit differently, where mostly we look at how a poll compares to others of the same state or district, and there's not as much crossover permitted um, between districts, um, because there are some pollsters that might... Um, have a different view of the electorate, right? And they're very friendly to Democrats in some states and not so friendly in others. Um, and just empirically, it works better if you kind of keep those house effects mostly contained within the state. Um, then there are a few changes um, as a result of COVID that kind of mirrors changes in the presidential model. We assume there's a bit more uncertainty on election day with respect to turnout and the voting margin. Um, so specifically about 20% more uncertainty than the default version of the model. Um, but there aren't as many kind of complicated heuristics around COVID as we use for the presidential model. So those are the main things. None of them are hugely consequential. Um, it does make the model a teensy tiny bit more conservative. So maybe, you know, maybe Democrats are 58 and they would be 61 or something, but it's not really going to make that much difference. And when we look at the polling across the country in these Senate contests, how does it compare to past cycles? Are we getting a lot of Senate polling more than 2018 less? Is there less focus on the Senate because of the presidential race? I mean, it's decently well covered. Um, uh, in general, we're getting like a lot of um, kind of pollsters learn the lessons. So ABC News, our parent company, Washington Post, right? They hardly ever did state polls last cycle. They're doing like um, several waves of state polls this year. Our friends at The Upshot uh, and Siena are doing a wave of state polls. You have these Kaiser Family Foundation state polls. Um, I mean, definitely, right? There are like the presidential states where you get the double dip, right? You know, in North Carolina and um, Arizona, um, then you have, you know, Minnesota with a Democrat defending his or her seat, excuse me. Um, you know, in those states, you're getting a lot of double dipping, right? Um, the states where you have a competitive Senate race, but not a competitive presidential race, you know, like South Carolina. Um, you know, at this point, Colorado is barely competitive in the presidential race. Uh, Montana is probably not competitive in the presidential race. I mean, Montana has been a little bit under poll, but it's not... It's not terrible. I mean, pollsters got the message that like, hey, state polls are a lot more, have a lot more utility than national polls. And one reason for that is that in some of the states, you happen to have a competitive Senate race too. So I want to move on and ask some listener questions. But before we do that, uh, just a general question. When is the House forecast coming out? And can you preview Republicans' chances of winning the House? The House model is about 98% done, so it's just going to come out um, relatively soon when um, 
when we final our QCing on it. Um, it's not going to say anything surprising. I mean, Republicans are, are um, how to put it, they're barely even putting up an effort to contest enough House seats to really make it competitive. It's a narrower playing field than in 2018. Um, and they could win it, but that probably involves a case where, like, just everything is going to hell for Democrats. The polls are way off, and it's a Democratic nightmare. Um, any scenario where Democrats um, win the Senate, they're very likely to have retained the House as well, probably by a fairly large margin. And in fact, Democrats might retain the House even in the event of a Trump presidency. Um, that Trump's odds are um, are better by some magnitude than Republicans' odds in the House. All right, let's get to some listener questions. We, again, got a lot of listener questions, so thanks to everyone for sending those in. Our first question comes from Noah. And Nate, I think this might be a question that you've gotten a lot. Um, So here we go. Joe Biden's odds of winning have gone up, according to the forecast, as his lead in the national polling hasn't really changed. Why is this? And then just to give uh, an example of the numbers, at the end of August, Biden had a 67% chance of winning. Now he has a 75% chance of winning. Whereas at the end of August, he had a 7.1 point lead nationally, and now he has a 6.9 point lead nationally. So not much of a difference in the national lead, but a noticeable difference in his odds of winning the presidency. So what's going on? So there, there's a main thing and there's a secondary thing. Um, the main thing is that as you get closer to the election, then there's less uncertainty. Um, as we kind of famously talked about, we think this is an election that comes with fairly high uncertainty for various reasons. But a lot of that is based on the notion that with all the crazy news and all the crazy economic data, that like things could just be very volatile. Um, and instead, the polls have been fairly steady, right? So every day that goes by um, without Trump um, closing the race is a good day for Biden, right? Um, I think our model with the current sending the polls will get up to, you know, Biden being, a, I don't know the number exactly, probably 88-ish or 90-ish percent favorite on election day with his current lead in the polls. Um, so the passage of time helps Biden. Keep in mind, too, our model has a prior that expects the rate race to tighten. Um so if the race does tighten a bit, that's in line with the model's expectations. If it doesn't tighten, then Biden may actually be gaining relative to where the model thought the race would be. That's the that's the main thing. And how um, much does it expect it to tighten by Election Day? Well, it's confusing because it still kind of thinks Trump's in a little bit of a convention balance, which offsets the other direction. But then it'll tighten after that. Right. But it expects um, actually not that much at this point. It expects it to be like half a point or a point's worth of tightening. Um the secondary thing is that um, is that national polls are not used that heavily by the model, right? People mistake national polls for our forecast of the popular vote, which is not true, right? National polls are just one way you can forecast the popular vote. Um, the other way you can do it um, is to kind of add up all your state by state estimates. And in fact, that's closer to what the model does. Um, so national polls are influential on the model mainly because of what we call a trend line adjustment, which is, let's say there's been no polling in, I don't know, um, Alaska for a month. And in that time, Trump has gained two points more or less what the model will do is, um, is take the result that we had a month ago in Alaska, add two points to Trump for it, and then, Voila, you have an updated estimate of where the race currently stands in Alaska. Um, there are some more wrinkles. It uses similar states, etc. But right now, we actually have quite a lot of recent state polling data. So we don't have to resort to using a poll from a month ago in Minnesota when we have 37,000 polls of Minnesota in the past week. Um, and so therefore, national polls don't really have much influence on the forecast right now. So are you saying that Biden has improved his standing in state polls as national polls have remained steady? And that's part of why? No, national polls have have probably tightened a bit. Um, You know, I mean, Trump's leads up to or deficits down to like 6.7 or something as of this morning. Um, It was eight and a half or nine at one point. So that's tightening, right? If you look at the state by state polling averages, 
you wouldn't see that much tightening. You might see might see half a point to a point, but there are also states um, like Arizona and Minnesota where Trump is polling better than he was pre-convention or states like Wisconsin where he's polling like at least as well as he was pre-convention. Um, so, so it's not clear. The other thing too is like we have a higher quality set of data in the state polls this year. Um, a lot of the expensive high budget pollsters have gravitated towards state polls, which is good. Um, a lot of weird, you know, Canadian <laughs> uh, online firms have been doing national polls and seem to be afraid to get in the states and things like that. And so, um, so it's higher quality data in the states, and that's some reason to to be more skeptical of the notion that the race is tightening. But again, the race can tighten a bit, but that can be outweighed by the passage of time. Right, and right? just to clarify. What's a reason that, you know, we would see the race tighten nationally, but not tighten in the battleground states? I'm trying to get this across. Like, it's not clear the race is tightening nationally, right? Oh, oh, oh. it might just be bad polling, whereas we have better quality polling in the states that says that it's about where it was before. Per, per, perhaps, right? But Got the it. national poll average is not our estimate of the popular vote. It's an yeah, average yeah. of national polls, which is one poll series, right? If you think of national polls as like... um Think of it as like one really big state. Does that make sense, right? It's a polling series um, of polls that are national, right? But like, but it's not the summation of all the individual states necessarily. There can be a gap there and where that gap exists. So in 2012, um, national polls kind of showed um, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney nearly tied. Maybe Obama had by a point or two, right? If you looked at state polls and then said, OK, here's the average in every state. Let's wait by the projected turnout and add them together. Obama led by more like two or three points. He went up winning by four points. Right. So when there's a gap between the state polls and the national polls, the state polls, if you do the work, can actually give you a better estimate of the national vote and the national polls themselves. Um, Got it. So that's kind of the more complicated math there. Next question. Does the model take into consideration how much of the population has already voted? So, for example, if the race were to tighten in the final week or so, but because of early votes, some percentage of the population has already voted and won't be affected by that tightening, does the model try to account for that in any way? No, I mean, look, um, intrinsically, the model gets more confident as you get closer to the election, intrinsically polls get better as you get closer to the election or more accurate, I should say. Um, I certainly think it's plausible that when you have more early voting, um, that polls therefore lock in a bit earlier. Um, I, I would keep in mind that in 2016, though, we had a fairly dramatic late swing toward Trump in the polls at our model picked up, maybe not to get quite enough of it, but like it certainly picked up some big shifts after the Comey letter. Um, and there were a lot of theories about how there had been male voting, the numbers were good for Clinton, and those theories proved not to be very wise. Um, so I don't know, I, especially in a year where you have so many people using a different voting method when they have before. Um, pollsters might have trouble getting a handle on that, and they might be surprised by certain things, right? And so I, I think this is like, like, that's a change you might implement in the 2024 model if the polls are accurate this year, including in states where you have a bunch of male voting for the first time. I would not count on that, per se, um, to be something pollsters will have an easy time with this year. Although they could. It's a, it's a plausible theory. Our next question is from Jeffrey. He asks, what would the model output currently be if every state operated like Maine and Nebraska, awarding two delegates to the statewide winner and all other delegates based on congressional district voting? Would this system tend to favor Democratic or Republican candidates? Um, it would tend to favor um, Republicans because the median congressional district is a little bit to the right. Um of of the median voter um, because of kind of gerrymandering left over from 2010 and some clustering of Democrats in urban districts. Um, now, this has changed a bit because a lot of exurban suburban districts that were drawn to favor Republicans are now much more purple. But Nate, would it favor Republicans 
overall or would it favor Republicans relative to the current electoral college system that we have? Oh, um, it might be pretty close. Yeah. Um, like <clears throat> in 2012, Mitt Romney would have done much better with that map, um, for example. But between kind of the state level map getting worse for Democrats and the districts getting better, then it would be pretty close. But both would have kind of a, a built-in Republican bias. I mean, the main issue with that is like, um, you know, you therefore make gerrymandering super important and have huge consequences for the presidential race. Um, so personally, I think it's fine if, if North Carolina excuse me, if Nebraska and Maine want to do it. Although I will say, Nebraska and Maine, there's a lot of code that I have to write every year because of you. Georgia, your runoffs. Georgia, I have to write a lot of... And Louisiana, God forbid Louisiana, I have to write a lot of extra code every year because of, of you, states like you. Um, Maine with the ranked choice voting. Maine, stop it. You're already doing the congressional district split. You can't do ranked choice voting too. It's a lot of code. I mean, come on, guys. Um, but anyway, we also got, I like, I like questions. Maine. I'll put up with Maine. If it was like, like Oregon or something that was making me do this. I mean, just forget it. But yeah, uh, we got a bunch of questions about turnout and essentially how we consider pollsters, different turnout models. If they publish various different polls based on different turnout models, um, and, and also this is a question we get a lot, which the answer is no, but do we do our own turnout model to try to like filter the polls through what we think the turnout will be? So the answer to that is no, but how do we consider polls that have different turnout models? We do project turnout in the sense that we need to know how to forecast the popular vote and to forecast the popular vote, um, which again, doesn't really matter, but we do have a popular vote forecast if you care about it, in addition to electoral college forecast. Um, you have to kind of know at least what the relative turnout is in each state. Um, so um, what we don't do, though, is we don't say, OK, we think turnout's going to be higher than the polls expect among this group. Therefore, let's shift the polls to Biden or whatever or to Trump. We trust the pollsters themselves to do that. Um, so we kind of project turnout. We project the vote based on the polls, but they're kind of they're kind of orthogonal to one another, right? They don't really affect each other. Um, what do we do when a pollster has multiple turnout models? Well, we, um, we always use anything they call likely voters over anything they call registered voters. Um, in general, likely voter polls are more accurate. Um, you have some polls that have multiple versions of a likely voter model. Um, what we generally do is just average those together. Um, so Monmouth, for example, Today, um, they were recording, this had like a high turnout model and a low turnout model in Arizona. One showed a tie, one showed Biden plus two. We averaged those together, you wanted with Biden plus one, right? They also had a registered voter poll that had Biden plus four. We don't use that registered number at all. Um, the one exception is sometimes a pollster will say, here is our main likely voter model, and here are some alternative scenarios, right? If a pollster does that, then we defer to them and say, okay, this is their preferred likely voter model, right? Um, so again, it's a little complicated and we have a kind of this like patchwork of rules that have evolved over the years, but that's how we handle that particular issue. Next question is from Rakesh. It's essentially, does the margin of error that a poll comes with affect how much importance we place on it in our polling averages? So say, uh, the margin of error of one poll of Pennsylvania is 5% and another poll is 3%. Does the one with 3% get more weight or, or how do we uh, account for that? So the poll with a larger sample size gets more weight um, and margin of error more or less is an indication of sample size. Um, we don't use sample size per se because some polls are... Um, are more honest about their margin of error than others. And they're generally better polls that do that, right? So there's something called a design effect, which means that when you do a lot of weighting, W-E-I-G-H-T in a poll, um, it increases the margin of error. Um, some pollsters will be honest about that, said, hey, we had to do a lot of weighting here to get enough Hispanics or enough working class white voters, right? Therefore, the margin of error is actually 5%, not 4%. 
Um, we don't want to punish that poll because the other polls are doing weighting too. They're probably just not telling you about it, right? So we use we use a sample size as a short version to to figure out how much weight to put on polls in our in our averages. All right, we got two more questions. The last one is pretty nerdy and applies to people who have probably been following closely um, all of the polls that we have been adding to the model. The question is, what on earth is going on with the USC Dornsife tracking poll? Is it considered any differently by the model? And to give some context for people who have not closely been following the USC Dornsife tracking poll, Recently, over the past couple of weeks, it's gone from a 12-point Biden lead to a 7-point Biden lead, where we haven't seen the same tightening, per se, quite nationally. Um, what's up with that poll? So there is a big flaw in the USC Dornsife tracking poll. Ooh, um, calling out the pollsters. And the USC PR department... You can send me all the nasty emails you want, but I think you did a, a, a not very thoughtful job with designing this poll, USC, right? That I just discovered this morning. Um, so the USC poll is what's called a panel survey, which means they re-interview the same people. Um, I like panel surveys. They let you see movement, right? There's some concern that, okay, well, let's say you happen to get stuck with a really Biden-leaning or Trump-leaning panel when you're stuck with that the whole year, which I agree is not ideal, but like, it's nice to see whether the same voters are changing their minds, right? Um, So in 2016, how their poll worked is they would report the results for the last seven days. Every seven days, one seventh of their sample was asked, how do you feel today, right? Have a chance to respond. And so the whole panel is represented in the poll. This year, they are showing you what happened in the last seven days but they're only interviewing people once every 14 days, which means at any given time, only half the panel is represented. And it kind of oscillates back and forth between one half and the other half. Um, and if you look at their poll, it's kind of followed like a sine wave pattern where there seems to be a more Trump leaning group just by chance alone. Right. And a more Biden leaning group. Um, and depending on where you are in that two week cycle, um, that will affect whether Biden or Trump has relatively good numbers. So this is like a, uh, I just discovered this this morning. This is a pretty strange way to do a tracking poll. It's kind of the worst of both worlds now, right? You're not so really the comparing the like to like. people are seeing is not necessarily based on news events or people changing their minds. It's the fact that the sample has completely switched. It's like you're a merry-go-round, right? And on one side of the or carousel, on one side of the carousel, it's a little bit more Biden-y. On one side, it's a little bit more Trumpy, right? And so, but the movement is kind of, it's not fake, but like, but the whole point of a panel survey is like, you are surveying the same people over and over, right? Um, or there are some panels where you do a mix of older and newer people, but they're kind of, it's kind of like in the uncanny valley where like, it's not a new random sample every time, but it's also not really letting you show movement. And in fact, like the set of people that are in the poll this week are exactly the opposite of the people that were in the poll one week ago, but the same as people that were in the poll two weeks ago. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. My advice, USC Dornsife, the way you're doing this, I mean, I don't know why you're doing it this way, right? But go ahead and show a 14 day interval. I mean, that's at least kind of honest where like you're showing the whole panel. You're not going to have these kind of phantom swings that are, you know, I don't know. I think it's 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 a big problem, and it doesn't change how we affect the poll and our averages. We're not making like subjective adjustments based on our feelings about a poll. We don't treat panel service any differently. Maybe we should, but it does mean I think people should be very careful about um, about making inferences about how the race is changing. Right? It's also a bit lagging too, where actually they only serve you once every fourteen days, and then you have fourteen more days to respond. Um, so you may say, oh, there was a big shift toward Biden today, right? That actually reflects a change from voters' view from 27 days ago or something, right? And so it's just, uh, it's a cool concept, but like they just made this change that makes it really hard to interpret and makes it kind of useless. And it's going to probably lead to this like sine wave pattern where there is um, movement that doesn't really track with anything else. So, yeah. All right. The last question is, and it reads, my question for Nate is, if he absolutely had to place a bet on the forecast, does he lean one way or the other? 
If so, why? Would you buy? Would you sell one candidate or the other based on the forecast model today? And I assume this is the presidential forecast model. I will say what I've said before in writing it on this show, which is that, um, you know, the model came out with a lower probability for Biden than I expected intuitively. And it's Biden since gained ground in our forecast, right? Um, so maybe there's not that disconnect anymore. Um, another thing I'll say is, um, you know, I think, um, I think uh, that all the incentives in 2020 are to be, I mean, people overweight the last example and they overfight the last war, right? And so kind of all the incentives for pollsters, et cetera, are going to be kind of quite careful. Certainly all the incentives for people that are formulating the conventional wisdom, right? You can't go wrong by saying, oh, Trump's still got a chance. And hey, we do that too, right? Our headline and our kind of story when the model came out last month was don't count Trump out, right? In part because there are some other models that we think we're way too bullish on Biden. So we feel like we have some actual non-hypocritical sentence to say that when there are, you know, there are some models that we think we're very Exorb, uh, not exorbitant, exuberant on Biden's chances. Um, but, um, but look, um, so I don't know. On the other hand, like, so I think in some ways, like the model makes assumptions that are a little bit on the conservative side. On the other hand, having Biden with a roughly three out of four chance um, feels like a pretty sensible position for a model to be in given where the race is right now. Um, and again, it has increased, right? It's gone from, you know, I guess it hasn't increased that much, right? It went from like 71 to like 67 to to 75 or 76, right? So there's some, you see some shifts there as a result of kind of getting near the election. Um, but yeah, if I actually had to bet, I mean, people are dumb about this stuff, right? People are like, I'm just going to be some robot uh, placing bets on my forecast. I mean, no, I mean, you would like, you know, I face a lot of um, professional, we all do it 538 in some ways, right? I mean, there are lots of like kind of consequences to the way people perceive our forecast versus the reality of them and kind of how candidates win and what consequences they win by. Um, and those consequences are probably larger than, um, than some stupid amount of money that most people are betting and predict it or whatever, right? I mean, the whole people are like, oh, you know, if you really had skin in the game, first of all, I might make some bets if I were ethically <laughs> and contractually allowed to do so, right? But the whole notion that, oh, I don't have skin in the game. I mean, like, fuck you. I have, like, so much more skin in the game than anybody else that I actually get a forecast right. Um, you know, then you're betting oh, like, 2000 bucks on predicted. As in, like, if people perceive our forecast to be wrong, that's pretty bad for us at 538 in terms of... Right, and again, yeah. there are all types of issues about what's going to be perceived to be wrong or right. I think people have become more educated about that, but I have all the f***ing incentives in the world to have um, the most accurate forecast that we can, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. All right, well, that's a good note to end on, so thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. I get worked up in the model talk sometimes. I know, I know, it's good. We like to see it. Um... It, it's because you have skin in the game, like you said. Anyway, of course, we will have the opportunity to answer more listener questions in the future. So if you have any questions, send them our, send them our way, either on Twitter or to podcast at 538.com. But for now, my name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Also, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. If you are listening to this right now, you should know that you can also watch it if you so choose. Um, but anyway, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon.